In this edition of Myths of Ancient History, we're going to look at the myth of the Sumerian handbags, which you'll find discussed in many different videos on YouTube. I'm going to examine one of these videos in particular, one of the more popular ones. It's found on the Ancient Architects channel, run by Matt Sibson, titled, What's Inside the Sumerian Bag? Secret Knowledge of a Lost Ancient Civilization. In it, we are told that the subject of the handbags has been a, quote, real head-scratcher for researchers, unquote. I understand he's trying to create an air of mystery here, but I'm here with some good news. In regard to the images being shown on screen, we know exactly what they are. Here's how Matt Sibson summarizes the state of the field on the subject of the handbags. They are strongly associated with deities and are without doubt a symbol of great importance. But if you ask 10 different researchers for their interpretation of these, you are likely to hear 10 different ideas. Nobody knows what they are or what they represent. Now, sometimes people use the word researcher to mean simply anyone who looks at the art whether they have a thorough knowledge of ancient history or not. So yeah, maybe there are varied interpretations among uninformed researchers. But as far as Assyriologists go, they have been able to determine exactly what these Assyrian demigods are carrying in their hands. They're called Dalu. In Assyrian, the term Dalum indicates a bucket for drawing water. Examples of both round-bottomed and cylindrical Dalu buckets with handles are those depicted on the friezes of Shalmaneser III's Black Obelisk, and identified as such in the epigraphs of the same monument. Here you can see handled Dalu buckets with a globular shape and a button base in the Black Obelisk. These here are cylindrical and rounded Dalu buckets in the Black Obelisk, which are the same type as seen on the reliefs depicted in Ancient Architects' video. A synonym for these objects is bandudu. That the terms bandudu and dalu denote the same type of bucket is confirmed by an Akkadian medical commentary. There's a lexical equation in there that says drawing bucket, defined as dalu, also called bandudu. Not only have we seen these buckets in art, we've seen them in real life. Archaeology has uncovered some of them. A well-preserved example of an 8th century bronze bucket from northern Syria is illustrated in O.W. Muscarella's catalog. It may be taken as the best candidate for the cylindrical type of Dalu bucket. In western Luristan, a bronze pail with a swinging handle was also found. All of these are at the Met in New York and can be seen there. Dalu were made of metal, copper, bronze, silver, even gold. To be clear, when I say that the buckets are real, I'm not saying that the figures holding them were real. I'm saying only that the Assyrians depicted their divine figures holding implements with which the Assyrians themselves were familiar. They did create their gods in their own image, after all. To be fair, Ancient Architects does identify these so-called handbags as buckets. Nevertheless, he is inconsistent on this point as he frequently also calls them bags throughout his video but they're clearly not bags. There is therefore no mystery as to the identity of these handheld objects. They are strongly associated with deities. From 3500 BC, the area around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were the home of various Mesopotamian cultures, including the Sumerians. Their gods were known as the Anunnaki. He switches from the Assyrians to the Sumerians here and then starts talking about the Sumerian deities called the Anunnaki implying that the buckets have something to do with the Anunnaki. The Assyrians never called the creatures they depicted on these palace reliefs as Anunnaki. They referred to them as the Apkalu. The term Apkalu is Akkadian and has multiple uses, but usually refers to some form of wisdom. Translations of the term generally equate to English terms like the wise, sages, experts, words like that. But the term also specifically refers to special sages, the ones who were thought of as semi-divine guardians, apotropaic figures. And if you're wondering what apotropaic means, it just means they have the power to ward off evil. These semi-divine guardians are the ones that we see in these images holding the buckets. 
Although the word Apkalu ultimately is derived from the Sumerian word Abgal, the Sumerians almost always use the word generically for the wise. There is one Sumerian temple hymn that refers to the seven sages, and these are special figures, so the myth may have its roots in Sumer, but there are no Sumerian texts describing them as guardians, nor any depictions of the Apkalu anywhere in Sumerian art, so far as we've discovered anyway. The earliest depictions come from Assyrian, not Sumerian art. The Assyrians are the ones who seem to have fully developed this mythology, and the Babylonians to a limited degree also have it. Our earliest known written reference to the Apkalu as guardians is from a ritual incantation text called Bitmeseri. It means house of detention. It was discovered in the ruins of the library of the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. He ruled in the 7th century BCE. The text, which formed part of the curriculum of exorcists, showed how to ward evil spirits away from one's house. The second tablet of this book describes in detail how figurines should be made or paintings drawn of the Apkalu and then arranged in a sick person's room close to their bed as a form of protection and how to make invocation to make these figures incarnate. Here's an excerpt from the work. To the seven figures of Puradu Apkalu. The word Puradu indicates that the Apkalu are composite beings, hybrids, and they're often seen with human bodies and animal heads, though sometimes just in human form. To the seven figures of Puradu Apkalu, painted with gypsum and black paste that are drawn at the side of the bedroom at the wall. To the seven figures of the consecrated cornel. A cornel is a plant. They stand in the gate of the bedroom nearest the sick man at the head of the bed. To the seven figures of Apkalu or Tamarisk, kneeling, that stand at the foot of the bed. So you can see how they were all arranged around the sick person's bed. The third tablet of Bitmaseri includes the earliest extant list of the Apkalu. There are 11 of these beings, seven antediluvian, meaning they come from the time before the flood, and four that are post-diluvian. Uana, who accomplishes the plans of heaven and earth. Uanaduga, who is given broad understanding. Enmaduga, to whom a good fate is decreed and Magalama, who was born in a house. <laughs> if you're wondering why that was so special, I think it means a special house. And Mabaluga, who grew up in a pasture land. Ananlida, the conjurer from Eridu. Utuabzu, who ascended to heaven. The pure Puradu fishes, means hybrid fishes. The Puradu fishes from the sea, the seven of them, the seven Apkalu, born in the river, who control the plans of heaven and earth. Then there are other ones mentioned, besides seven. There were probably myths associated with each of these beings. The four Apkalus of human descent, whom the Lord Ea has endowed with broad understanding. A Babylonian priest by the name of Barosis, who wrote in the 3rd century BCE a work called the Babyloniaca, told the myth of how the first of the sages, Uana, the first one in the list from the Bitmaseri text. Barosis calls him Oanes, which is the Greek form of his name he wrote in Greek. He says, Uana taught humans many things. He gave them an insight into letters and sciences and every kind of art. He taught them to construct houses, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which could tend to soften manners and humanize mankind. From that time, so universal were his instructions, nothing has been added material by way of improvement. <laughs> in other words, every technology that humans had was taught to them by Uana, and nothing has ever been improved or added to since. Keep in mind that the purpose of myth, in general, is to explain the origins of everything by means of the supernatural. Even human inventions were commonly attributed to the supernatural by the ancient people. It's very common in ancient myths to assume that all technology appeared in the world at exactly the same time. If we wanted to bring Barosis up to date, we would say that Uana invented the telephone, the television, the internet, and iPhones as well. Now keep in mind Barosis wrote in the 3rd century BCE, which is many centuries after these Assyrian reliefs were made, and it's also the Babylonian version of the myth of the Apkalu, so 
there may be some differences, but it's all we have to go on. Apkalu reliefs appear prominently in Neo-Assyrian palaces, most notably the constructions of King Ashurnasirpal II of the 9th century BCE. The Apkalu appear in one of three forms there, bird-headed, human-headed, or dressed in fish-skin cloaks. They've also been found on reliefs from the reign of Sennacherib. These representations of Apkalu were used, just as we said, to ward off evil. The cylindrical buckets constitute one of the two peculiar implements of the Apkalu depicted in the Assyrian palace reliefs, the other being the cob-shaped object. These images are usually found in palaces, and what they show is a visualization of the purification and enlightenment of the king. The higher spiritual self of the king is represented by the tree of life in the center of the image. The spirits or gods are tending to the king, enacting a sacred enlightenment ritual to elevate him to god status. The tree that's seen in many of these images clearly has religious meaning. Without having an actual Assyrian title for it, Assyriologists just call it the sacred tree. The overall shape of the tree, its palmet top, its surrounding arch of palmets, indicate that it is most likely a date palm. The network of wavy lines extending from the tree to other palmets suggest irrigation canals. So what we have here is probably a date palm orchard. Because we have no unambiguous reference to the tree in Assyrian documents, many different theories have been proposed as to what it symbolizes. One plausible suggestion being that it refers to the fertility of the land of Assyria. Ancient architects' assertion that it represents the king of Assyria comes from a hypothesis propounded by Simo Parpola, a respected scholar who draws the idea from medieval Jewish mystical texts of the Kabbalah movement that were written centuries later. In some of these texts is found a tree emblem called the Tree of Life or Sephirotic Tree. The Sephirotic Tree in the Kabbalah texts is said to represent three concepts the nature of the cosmos, the nature of God, and the nature of the ideal man. Parpola argues that the Jewish Sephirotic tree was based on the Assyrian sacred tree, and therefore the Assyrian tree may represent the same concepts. The ideal man, Parpola proposes, may have been the Assyrian king. I believe this is where ancient architects is getting this from. Parpola argues that since in some instances in the Assyrian reliefs, an image of the king appears instead of the image of the tree, that must mean the tree represents the king. But there are images that feature both the tree and the king together, showing that they are separate entities. Also, the Apkalu faced towards the entryway of the palace, which not only the king passed through, but also all his courtiers and any visitors. So does the tree represent all of them too? Probably not. Instead, we probably should understand their gestures towards the tree, the king, and all visitors to the palace as giving protection to all of them, protecting them from evil. The links between the tree of life from the Kabbalah and the Assyrian sacred tree aren't really strong enough for us to be sure that they're connected. The Sephirotic tree, for example, is not a date palm. So Parpola's interpretation has not been widely accepted by Assyriologists, but who knows? Maybe the Kabbalah tree was inspired by the Assyrian tree. We just need to be careful not to retroject all kinds of later ideas onto earlier symbols uncritically. Because by doing that, we assume that nothing changes over time, that things always stay the same. The cob-shaped object we so commonly see is a pine cone. Ancient architects is likely correct on this point. This bumpy oval object is usually identified as a conifer cone. It's also been identified as a flower cluster. Date palms, even to this day, often need to be hand pollinated. Procedure is to cut a ripe male date palm cluster, carry it up to the female tree, and shake its pollen over the female flowers. Water is also used in the process, so to see the Apkalu bringing water and flower clusters to the sacred date palm could mean that they're pollinating it. In some cases, we do see more obvious flower clusters in their hands. We also see them carrying palm branches and ears of corn. All of these things are related to agriculture or horticulture. 
Whether the oval object is a conifer cone or a flower cluster, the fact that the Apkalu are approaching the sacred tree with water buckets and other flower clusters suggests that they are tending to it in some way. And our knowledge of the Apkalu from the documents we discussed suggests that their actions in some way are intended to ward off evil. The pine cone is the same as the lotus flower in other ancient traditions. It represents the pineal gland, which is known as the third eye, the position of the crown chakra. When the third eye opens, like a pine cone opening or a lotus flower blooming, the initiate is said to obtain enlightenment. Whoa, whoa. Without any justification, ancient architects is now bringing in Indian philosophy with a splash of New Age spirituality and applying it to Assyrian images. As far as I'm aware, there is no reference to a third eye in any ancient Mesopotamian documents. So he has no basis for making such a correlation. If he does, he certainly doesn't provide any. Even more astounding is his assertion that the Assyrians connected the pine cone with the pineal gland of the brain. We have no evidence that the Assyrians even knew of the pineal gland. I suppose it's possible that they saw a few of them when they bashed people's heads in, if they looked really closely, but they certainly don't have a word for it in their language. It's true that the pineal gland looks like a pine cone, and in fact is even named after it, but that doesn't mean that a pine cone in ancient Assyrian art automatically refers to the pineal gland of the brain. The ancient Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman mystery schools would teach initiates to open their third eye to reach enlightenment, and these Mesopotamian images are clearly scenes of enlightenment. Now he attempts to link the images of the Apkalu with Greco-Roman mystery schools. There was no such thing as Mesopotamian mystery schools or Egyptian ones. The ones that popped up in Egypt or were inspired by Egyptian myth were, in fact, Greek. But the link that he suggests here is the concept of enlightenment, which is such a general idea that it could be linked to anything. Want to hear something that no one else knows? Enlightenment. I just watched the news. Enlightenment. I learned a new language. Enlightenment. I just flicked on the switch. Enlightenment. Someone just pointed out I have a booger in my nose. Enlightenment. Despite the ease with which he could connect something with enlightenment, he never even bothers to establish that the Mesopotamian images have to do with enlightenment. He just asserts it. I guess he thinks a person can simply Note how a pine cone looks similar to the pineal gland, and presto, you have a link to enlightenment. He says that the Greco-Roman mystery schools were associated with enlightenment. But you know what? All schools are associated with enlightenment. There's nothing unique about that. And his claim that the mystery schools of Greece and Rome taught initiates about the third eye is simply false. They taught no such thing. He hasn't shown, therefore, any solid connection between the images of the Apkalu and the Greco-Roman mystery schools. I'm open to the idea that Mesopotamian ideas influenced Greece and Greece influenced Rome. After all, we know they had contact with each other, and indeed, influence has been demonstrated in other areas. But ancient architects hasn't shown any influence here. Maybe he did this in another video, I don't know. In the second part of this discussion, I will address ancient architects' attempt to link the Apkalu and their buckets to additional cultures. If you're interested in seeing it, please click the subscribe button and YouTube will let you know when I post it. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you next time.